So I'm really, really delighted to um, introduce the speaker for our last session today. Um, Sarah Schuster is the editorial director of the Mighty's Contributor Network. And you know, you heard Ashley and Elisa talking about sharing their story. Well, Sarah's um, session today is the power of storytelling. Um, and the Mighty, for those of you, who, who's familiar with the Mighty in this room? If you could, oh, good, a good number of you. Those of you who aren't yet are gonna learn about it. Um, the Mighty is a digital health community created to empower and connect people living with health, health challenges and disabilities. Um, and the Mighty has over 10,000 contributors and two million registered users. Um, and its goal is to make health about people. So what could be better? So I'm really pleased and delighted to welcome Sarah to the stage, thank you. Thank you, Kathy. Whew. Hi, everyone. Like Kathy said, my name is Sarah. Um, I, I work at The Mighty. I get to manage and run our amazing contributor section where people who are experiencing chronic illness, mental illnesses, disabilities, all come together to share their personal stories. And The Mighty, we're trying to be the place that when you do Google your rare condition, you basically are able to find this portal of first person stories so that people can know they're not alone, um, put some context to the list of symptoms that I, you usually find. Um, and I'm so happy to be here. I don't have pichettes, um, but besides managing this group of contributors, I write about my own experiences with anxiety and depression, and I know I'm definitely not the only one in the room who <laughs> experiences that, so I'm just so happy to be here. Um, anyway, before I was writing and editing more professionally, I was pretty much just an obsessive journaler. Has anyone else kept a journal or a diary even when they were younger? Only a few people? Cool, okay. Um, for me, when I was younger, probably more in middle school, a journal was really a place for me just to write down the happenings of my daily life. You know, what I was doing, what my friends were doing. I know for a fact that my entire eighth grade journal is just why Matt Pavlos wouldn't kiss me. It's like this very dramatic up and down tale. <laughs> and uh, it wasn't until I got a little older and more life started happening to me that my journal quickly not just became a place where I would just write what was going on that day, it became actually the only place where I could start processing the more darker adult things that were happening to me. It was the only place where I could really dump out these feelings that I didn't know where else to put. And I love this quote from David Sedaris, if you guys are familiar, he's an author, humorist. Yeah, cool. Um, it's, I guess in my diary, I'm not afraid of being boring. It's not my job to entertain anyone in my diary. Um, and I love that quote because, and I actually think this was referenced throughout the day that we all have these filtered versions of ourselves that we present to the world, right? You're someone with your family, someone with your friends, someone with your doctor. And when you develop any kind of chronic condition, any chronic disease, all those relationships start to change, including the relationship you have with yourself, right? And so one of the benefits of journaling is that it can be a place where you don't have to filter yourself. You don't have to worry, what, what am I friend gonna think? What is my doctor gonna think? You can be as angry as you want about your situation. You can be as irrational as you wanna be about what's happening to you. You can vent, you can get stuff out there, and then you can also reflect, right? And you can, you know, after you look at kind of the mess you made of the scribbles, if you're like me, who's just like, you know, scribbling, I have a lot of emotions. Um, <laughs> you can then look at it and go, okay, what does this mean? How did I learn? It's a really great place to reflect. And um, for those of you at home, hi. Um, if you have a journal or if you have a diary, um, even for 10 minutes a day, just kind of free flowing, just writing out what's in your mind, it can be really beneficial. And actually one of the physicians mentioned just like, even just with remembering what you went through that day, right? I mean, you don't have to give your physician your diary, you can make like a separate physician friendly version of it. Um, but it could actually help you recall better what symptoms you were experiencing. It can help you, um, I don't know, process kind of what was really going on that day. And, uh, and I think 
another thing too is that it doesn't just have to be a journal. You can have a journaling mentality with other things too. A journaling mentality basically just means that you have a place to dump out all your stuff, right? So whether whether you have a friend who you could just be completely honest with, whether you um, you know you make artwork, you'd make videos. There are a lot of different mediums you can use to kind of have that space to dump all your stuff out. And I think I think that it's just really important for every person to have that space, but especially if you're going through changes, especially if your your life has been changed in some way from a disease, it can be working on that relationship with yourself and getting things out of your head and just on a piece of paper, into art, into wherever it is, can be really important. Uh, we're also here to spread awareness, right? So what changes when you start writing for other people? I also want to say too that what I'm gonna be talking about today is really writing for the internet. It's blogging, it's making videos, it's posting on Instagram. So one of the physicians said something that made me wanna say this, this idea that like you don't owe everyone your story, right? Um, it, it, it's a precious thing, it's personal. And I always wanna kind of caveat this whole thing by saying if you're someone who's ready, if you're someone who's blogging already, like Ashley, if you're someone who's ready to advocate, put your story out there, amazing, I hope these tips help. If you're somebody who's not there yet, and you're somebody who just like is so busy taking care of yourself, the thought of putting things out to the world is too overwhelming, that's okay too, right? Like it, when we talk about storytelling, even being honest with your friends about how you're doing and telling them the story of your day, that's a form of really important storytelling. Advocating for yourself and telling your doctor honestly about what you were doing, that's a form of storytelling. So all of these tips, they're blogging, they're internet tips, um, but it's not for everyone right now. And maybe um, like a long part of your journey, you'll feel comfortable and you'll be able to start opening up in this way. So I think people's first instinct when they want to tell their story is to start from the beginning and kind of go chronologically. And there's nothing wrong with that, right? There's nothing wrong with that. Um, a lot of these stories are complex. They need context. But we talk about what makes effective writing um, for kind of others to consume to spread awareness about your condition. I like to think about this idea that the whole journey you have is actually made of many moments. And I'm sure you guys have these kind of flashbulb moments that when you think about where to start, could actually be great places to start. I heard someone this morning talk about how, um, it was actually it was actually you, <laughs> it's okay, I'm sure, that talked about how like looking at like looking at her husband and saying, and I told him I couldn't drive. And that's when I knew. And I had a moment where I was like, that's a story. That, that moment when, I have it right there, the moment when you first realized something was wrong or that something had crossed a line or that you couldn't pretend anymore that everything was okay. That's a moment, that's actually a whole story in itself. The day you were diagnosed, people have talked about that. Like, we get a lot of stories about the good and the bad, the grief and the victory that can come with getting a diagnosis. That's a story. Um, a challenge you didn't predict, right? Just running into any kind of challenge, any kind of something that kind of swept you off your feet when you thought that you were okay. I bet someone else has experienced that challenge and that they'll relate to that story. Uh, that doctor's appointment I'll never forget, right? So this idea, good or bad, <laughs> a doctor who said something to you that really resonated with you in a great way that made you think about starting pacing or made you think about you know, a symptom in a little different way or maybe the opposite, right? Maybe a, a doctor's appointment that made you frustrated and you want to share that story so that other patients and other doctors know that something you went through wasn't acceptable. And then towards the end of your journey, that's when you might feel more comfortable giving advice, right? Giving tips, not to say that you have to be like, I'm healed and now I can give tips, right? Because obviously that doesn't happen <laughs> ever. Uh, but maybe when you're feeling like a little more comfortable in your own journey, that's when you can start turning to others and giving advice, right? Because I think it's a lot to ask for patients to be starting to give others advice on day one. I think that you, you know when it's time and you can look to people around you and you can start connecting with other people and, and giving back to the community that, that you're a part of. So some ideas if you're not sure what to write about, um, moments you'll never forget, right? So I kind of alluded to this before. I think there's probably moment, moments in all of your journeys that are really defining. Um, those make really good stories. This is one of my favorites, um, a feeling you just figured out how to put into words. So one of my favorite comments we get on The Mighty is someone saying, oh my God, 
I experienced this, but I never knew how to explain it. And you put words in my mouth. You like explained to me how something that I was feeling. So if you have a moment like that when you're like, ugh, like this, you know, certain type of brain fog or there's certain type of fatigue, I, you know, I'm going to explore ex like what that specific thing and explore what it feels like. You can almost put words in other people's mouths who are feeling it, but maybe don't have the words for it yet. Um, this is an interesting one. It's just thinking about like, good ways to like tell a story. So a line or a quote, something you can't get out of your head. So sometimes we'll have story. We'll talk about this a little later with the rare disease angle specifically, but some of our stories will be about like, I'm just going to make something up, like the line from The Princess Bride that like really struck me as someone with a chronic illness, right? And so you're like, The Princess Bride, like what? It's my favorite movie. I don't know if I've seen it. Um, and, um, and, and it's something that actually becomes more relatable to a general audience. And maybe it's a line about something not chronic illness or rare disease related at all, but because you're someone with a chronic illness and a rare disease, your interpretation, right? Music, movies, all of this stuff is, you know, we take it in as our own experiences. You can almost use this very relatable quote, a relatable thing that people might have heard of and you say this is my interpretation as someone with my experiences helps you spread awareness helps kind of capture people in a different way um, and also I think again like for people who can relate it's a good way to connect to people um, in a way besides symptoms in a way besides kind of the more classic things like you can connect based on a lot of different things um, any big feelings <laughs> so joy anger sadness um, it's a good time to journal also when you're feeling big feelings um, but also it's a, maybe a good thing to write about. Why did something, a great, so when we talk about um, comments from loved ones, right? So um, maybe a loved one very innocently saying like, when are you gonna get better? Or like, I don't know, like what, um, I don't understand you were, you know, fine yesterday and now you're, now you're not okay today. Um, to someone not in this community, I think it's hard to understand why that question would trigger such a big emotion. Because it's just like, they just asked you, if you if, when you were feeling better, like why is that a weird question to ask? And so when you feel these big feelings to maybe of things people would kind of take for granted and dismiss, uh, it's actually a great sign that it could be something to write about, right? And likely other people will relay um, the stuff that keeps you up at night. If, if there's something that you can't stop thinking about, it's possible other patients in your situation are thinking about it too. So that's another kind of angle to think about when you're trying to decide what to write. Another way to go about deciding what to write is to consider who your audience is, right? So who are you writing for? Are you writing for someone Googling Bichette's disease for the first time, right? Do you wanna be um, the first thing that comes up when someone who just got diagnosed and is kind of confused, what would you want them to say, to hear? What did you need to hear when you were first Googling Bichette's? So that thinking of who and putting yourself in the position of somebody who's seeking out information, that can inspire a lot of different pieces. We have a lot of letters on our site, right? So this idea of a letter to someone just diagnosed with something, a letter to someone who's experiencing this symptom for the first time, um, that can be a good way to connect to people who, um, who are sharing similar experiences as you. Um, so someone trying to work through a feeling. So that's a good one too, right? So when we're talking about these moments that make you feel really big, you can also think too, instead of just kind of writing, nothing wrong with ranting, but instead of just kind of writing a rant about why this comment made you so mad, you can explain why it made you mad. You can rant, whatever, it's fine. Profanity, a little profanity is fine on the mighty. <laughs> um, but then you kind of flip it around and you go, okay. What would I tell somebody who also experienced this, right? Like, what's the takeaway? Why, why, is this, why is it important that I feel angry? And what would I want someone who is also having a hard time explaining their illness to their friends to really know? Um, someone making a tough decision, right? So similarly, like kind of we're all being a little careful here. Like we don't give medical advice on the mighty, right? So tough decision, it can be more like, should I go back to work? A tough decision can be, do I show up to this party tonight? <laughs> Thinking about all the decisions you have to make in your life as someone with a rare condition and giving advice or even like talking through your own thinking, like not telling people like never go to the party, but talking through your own thinking of, I had a party, invite, here's why I ultimately decided not to go and explaining why and kind of validating someone who made the same decision as you to say, it's okay. It's okay if you had a pass. It's also okay if you went. Um, but just even no knowing your thought process, process making those decisions can be really helpful. 
Um, another audience are the loved ones, right? The caretakers, but also just your friends and family and people who just don't know what's going on. So again, we have a lot of letters or a lot of perspectives to family members, because I think also a lot of family members they want to help, right? They want to help you understand. They, friends want to be there for you. Good friends want to be there for you. And sometimes they simply don't know, right? That friend who asked that question of when are you going to get better might just not, maybe, maybe she's not great. I don't know. But she also just genuinely might just not know, right? So when we're talking to our loved ones and we're telling them what we need instead of assuming that they're going to, you know, figure it out for themselves, that's also a great way to frame a story and a great audience to talk to. Um, because not just helping, you know, fellow patients, it's helping the people who take care of them. And you guys, I'm sure, have a lot of perspective and a lot to say about what you wish your parents, your friends, your family um, knew about what it's like living with your condition and also what you need. I, I love that this idea like you can't take the pain away, right? So that again, a story, that's a great story. Talking to a loved one and going, you can't take my pain away, here's what you can do. And, and there's a story, right? It's all there. So when your condition is rare, um, the same rules apply, but I think that a problem, I think a lot of rare, can people who advocate for rare conditions um, run into is this idea that if it's not quote unquote like relatable to you, why would people care, right? And I think that people can probably relate to this because I'm sure before you were diagnosed with your condition, you weren't seeking out for fun stats and symptoms of rare diseases, right? It really only hits you when you're affected by it. And that's why doing things like, first of all, so the first thing is what I talked about before, taking these more general experiences that just as humans, people re relate to, thinking of anger, thinking of loss, grief, sadness, joy, relief, thinking of all these really relatable aspects um, that, can help you frame a story in a way that even somebody who isn't personally affected by your condition might be interested in reading, right? And then what you do is once they're in the story, you start explaining your symptoms. You start explaining information about Bichette's. You kind of sprinkle it into the actual piece that you're writing so that at the end they go, I learned something about this condition that I didn't know about, but maybe they wouldn't have you know, seeked an article called information about Bichette's disease, you know, but they really, but they what, what people, other people want to hear are your experiences and your emotions and how they relate to them. Um, another thing too when your condition is rare is that I think, and there's another thing too about this idea that you could go to any chronic illness um, support group and people will probably relate to you. That's another great angle too, that there's this idea that, yeah, not everyone understands what it's like to live with a chronic illness, but a lot of people do. And just because your condition is rare and just because you don't share the same actual diagnosis with you know, the people in your support group, it doesn't mean that you can't you know, relate and lean on each other. So a lot of the content at The Mighty, even if it's under a specific condition, the way we frame it and the way we present it is actually pretty general. So that people with chronic illnesses from you know, no matter what diagnosis they have can still read it, can still relate to it. Um, it's really, it's a good way to kind of find a community even when you feel like your community is so small. So as important it is to have spaces like this where you can look someone in the eye and you can talk about your specific symptoms, when you're advocating for a rare condition, there are a lot of rare conditions and everyone's kind of in it together and everyone's trying to find more information, more awareness, and you can use each other and build stories based on the shared experiences that you have, the friends and family who don't understand, the doctor who's never heard of your condition. <laughs> um, I heard someone said today about like doctors like Googling in the hallways, like <laughs> trying to find information. Um, like that's, it's, it's, and you guys are all, and there are so many moments today when like everyone was nodding their head, you know, like all of that is so great and all of those are moments that can bring anyone together who's navigating, you know, um, our pretty sometimes fractured healthcare system and trying to get answers and trying to get their, their um, lives kind of back on track. So what's next? I actually have a lot of time. This is great. I'm gonna slow down a little bit. Um, so there are a few things you can do, right? So the first one is uh, journaling. If you have, a, if you got a journal today, if you're at home, if you want to get a journal, or if you just want to get some scrap paper, whatever you need. Um, 
I think that for some people really do benefit from like morning journaling, right? So I'm just like every day, 10 minutes before you start your say, brain dump, get what's, get what's in your head out of your head and then kind of see how that helps you carry on to the day. For other people, it could look like, I'm always kind of like just, just like taking notes in my, I, I work with notebooks, so I have them everywhere. Just finding myself taking notes in my notebooks, just kind of saying a thought that I had, even if it's less formal, and you just like have a scrape of paper to write down something you're experiencing, that's totally fine. And like I said before too, just to reiterate this, not everyone likes writing, and that's like, okay, I like writing, but you all, you all don't have to like writing. Um, as long as you have kind of this journal mindset and you can uh, you know have an unfiltered version of yourself that you get to at least like cherish and work have a way to work on your relationship with yourself it could honestly be like like you know going for a slow walk or it can be the time that you spend with yourself in your bed is kind of like your sacred time as long as you're carving out these times for yourself where you can have this journaling mentality have this unfiltered mentality um, I know in my own experience, it helped me just like interact with the world a little better if I know that I can like get stuff out on paper. Um, you're also all going to get um, worksheets, I think, in your emails. Um, <laughs> everyone here and those living at home where we have a more bulleted list of how to join the Mighty's community. So um, the Mighty, I work on the publication side on the Mighty, but we're also a platform. Um, we actually have topic pages for every condition where people can just post thoughts and questions about living with their condition. Um, so that's something you can always do. You can always go to our, make an account, go to our topic page. And if you're not someone who wants to write this like big formal story, uh, you could actually just like post a little thought and maybe other people with Bichette's or with your similar condition uh, can find you and comment and connect. You can also, um, submit and become a mighty contributor which obviously that's like my plug <laughs> because we i do want to get more of a chef stories on the site i was looking and i think we have four contributors right now which considering how many people are in this room um is not enough so uh if you ever want to formally submit your story there will be instructions on this worksheet but you can uh say that you were at this conference and i'll i'll accept you <laughs> i i gotta have I'm the, i get the the be the boss on that one so if you say you're at this conference if you put Bichette, i think we said the handout to put Bichette's disease in the um in the title that you submit it i'll make sure your story goes on the mighty um we definitely have to be we have a small team so we have to be more selective with some of the pieces that we publish. Um, but for, for rare diseases, I think every perspective is so, every perspective is so important anyway, but um, it's definitely more important to get more stories and more perspectives, especially because everyone's perspective is so different. And so if we only have 10 Bequette stories right now, like we're not doing the community justice. So we need different perspectives. You're not gonna relate to every single story you read, but you might relate to chunks of it. You might, you know, and I think that why people submit to us, it's twofold, right? It's the fact that writing itself is very therapeutic. Um, it's a way to spread awareness about your condition. But also I think for a lot of writers, like getting the feedback is really nice too, right? So getting people to comment and say, me too, getting people to comment and say, uh, I, I understand this experiment, this experience completely. Our comment section is, a, is full of a lot of people who maybe have never seen their experience reflected before. Um, and now for the first time got to read a story from someone with their same condition, someone who relates. Uh, so there's, there's, you know, there's, it's a two-sided benefit and hopefully um, you kind of get both. I hope, you know, if you do try to blog or write a story that that is therapeutic for you. And then when it gets published and shared, it's a nice feeling to know that uh, it's not going nowhere. That's actually, a, it's, a, it's in a home of people who understand. And we do try to, our comment moderators are pretty diligent. So we do try to keep people who maybe don't understand and who would make comments that aren't so nice, uh, they're out of there. So I definitely encourage you to submit to the Mighty. It would make me very happy. Um, and there's information about that on your workout or your worksheets, which what you'll get. Um, <laughs> Uh, something that I wanted to also mention was I was having a conversation with Ashley last night. I'm going to call people out now. <laughs> Everyone who's ever talked to me is getting called out at this talk. Um, and something she said to me really struck me. And it, I realized it's a hesitation that a lot of people have before they think of not just journaling, but actually more formally advocating for and sharing their story. It's the fact that, and, and she said, she said, 
you know, when I first was thinking about reaching out this opportunity to tell my story, my first thought was, who am I to tell my story, right? I haven't had Bichette's the longest. I don't have the worst possible case. There surely are other people whose stories are more worthy than me uh, and who deserve more spotlight when it comes to advocating for these rare diseases, right? And I think you guys already know, like, no, that's, that's such a misconception. And I think in this world of kind of you know, influencers, and there are a lot of like chronic illness influencers are all on Instagram, they all take pretty pictures. There's this misconception that you have to be like that. You have to be this like certain type of person or you have to be a certain level of sick for your story to really matter and also for your story to be able to help others. And that's just not the case at all. Um, they said it right here, everyone's story is different, everyone's experience with Bichette's is different, and even though not every single person can relate to your story, how many nods I saw before when people were saying certain things, people can relate to certain elements of your story. And no matter where you are in your journey, if you choose to tell your story, um, it's important, someone's gonna benefit from it, definitely, and uh, you definitely deserve to tell it, there's no, I don't deserve to have my story told. Um, that's kind of the most important thing I'd want people to know. Um, that's all I got. That went by so fast, Kathy. I'm so sorry. I hope it's okay. Do you oh, have any perfectly questions? perfectly fine. No, that's great. Does anyone have any questions for Sarah? I'm gonna sit. <laughs> Ashley, does this inspire you, Elisa, for you guys to share your stories and yeah, camera? Exactly. Yeah, last night our conversation, um, your reaction, I, I told Kathy that as well. Like, um, when I saw Abja post about um, a video that was being made to raise awareness for Bichette's, I, um, I really stopped. First of all, I looked at the post and I was like, absolutely not, not sharing my story. It's not good enough. Um, and I scrolled past it, and something in my gut that night, um, I went back to the post, and I said, you know what, I'm just gonna send an email. And I heard back from them within 24 hours, like, you know, you're you're great for the video, come in, and ever since then, I have been um, going and advocating for Bichette's, and I think um, we all have to, like, we have to understand that everybody's story is different, and it's, um, yours deserves to be heard just as much as the, the next person. So I love that you touched on that. Yeah, I mean, I've been a member of the Mighty since it was in its infancy and watching it grow and watching it become this amazing site that, that we all can flock to and have this positive place to speak about our disease. It's just, it, it's amazing. I, I really commend the people at the Mighty for what they have done. Um, I share my story more in a field of what, what I'm comfortable with, which is, um, I'm a, I'm an actress, so I do more film and TV advocating type stuff in front of cameras than I do in writing, but, um, but I do make a, make a point to get on the mighty when I can, and, um, and I, I don't think I'm a contributor on Bichette's, but I know I tag it with Bichette's. And, um, and that feedback is just, is, is, is always just so great. I know the last time I posted the next, um, the next, I think it was chronic illness, uh, email that went out that was not the actual like formal stories, but the, con but the, the, like the, the, featured posts, it was my post and I was just, I That's was awesome. over the moon. And getting that That's feedback great. from that from that exposure was was absolutely it was key because it was, I was actually asking a question. So um, yeah, I I love I love that you guys were able to come out here and um, yeah, this makes me completely excited about more ways about telling my story after. Thank you, <laughs> thank you. I have to say, I was pretty thrilled how people raised their hands. I've been with the Mighty for five years now, and it's not, it used to be a thing where you wouldn't walk into a room and people, I mean, this room's a little different than an average room, I guess, <laughs> but it's still pretty cool for me. Hi, thank you so much for being here. Um, my name's Jessica, and um, I, my story is, long and um, I've been sick most of my life um, and I 
also represent um, a small subset group of Bichette's patients um, that have neurological symptoms. Um, and I advocate um, as much as possible for this disease as do my parents and my fiance. Um, and, you know, I'm, I also was an actress too um, prior to getting, you know, face ulcers and I was always on stage or behind the, the camera and um, in front of the camera. Sorry, that's the neuro stuff. Um, and so my question is, you know, I would love to con be an advocate and contribute. The problem, the, the way, the reason that I'm a little bit nervous is my days are very different. This week is my okay week. Last week, I was taking, you know, hydromorphone and throwing up and very, very sick. And, you know, I'm lucky that I got to, this is my well week because I drove with my mom here, you know. I was gonna come either way, but. Um, so my story, if I, if I did type out a story, um, would, would there be a way that it could be kind of looked at and reworded or, yeah. uh, so, <laughs> so I do, ha because of yeah. the neurological stuff. Yeah. We edit all of our stories. So that's, um, that's so great that you said that. So it might um, take me a, a couple days yeah. to, yeah. Okay. That's a great I, I totally hear you. And thank you for asking that question because I think a lot of people do have this hesitation. It goes back to this idea of, um, you know, my story has to be perfect and polished and, you know, no, maybe not. Are you talking about just like grammatically correct? <laughs> to like submit a part of it yeah. and and then and let you know to wait cuz I'm working on like the first part totally and, understood okay. okay so just to go more into our submissions process thank you so go into more of our submissions process you do submit directly through our site if you're someone who isn't comfortable submitting your whole story and you want to kind of get a second look at it first, I'll give you my card <laughs> and you could email it to me. Unfortunately, that's actually a great idea. Unfortunately, right now we don't have a, people can leave notes, right? So you can always leave a note to be like, hey, like this is partly unfinished or hey, like unsure about this. And editors 100% always take that into consideration. So right now I manage a team about seven editors. They all live with different conditions. We don't live with all of the conditions we cover, but we, you know, have people with disabilities, people with chronic illnesses, people who understand the communities that they're working with. And so not only are they editing for just like sentence structure and to make sure that the story flows, um, they're also looking at sensitivities, um, making sure that we have like editorial guidelines about specific things. So we'll definitely edit that just to make sure that the story works across all of our communities. Um, and when we publish it, um, it has been looked at, it has been, you know, given a title, given a picture, and if you're ever someone who wants to submit, but you're, you know, you want to, like, an editor's touch on it first, you can, I think we have this in the pamphlet, you can also email our contributor email, contributor at the mighty, contributors at the mighty .com. Um, but also, if anyone wants, just like I, I can give you my card. <laughs> if anyone wants to a more a more personal touch, um, because and even with the frequency of our writers, right? So one of the reasons why we have this kind of very lax contributor model is because we understand that people can can submit for us sometimes and not submit other times. I've had people come up to me and go. Like I'm, if they're like visiting LA, also our office is in Burbank and close to LA. So if you ever visit that area, please stop by. Um, but I've had contributors I've like taken out to lunch and they're apologizing about not being able to contribute. And I'm just like, no, 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 no. Like you are literally volunteering your time <laughs> to share your story with a community so that other people can understand. Like you do that when you can, you know, there's no obligation. And I kind of touched that you have to be, you know, opening yourself up and sharing yourself all the time. Like sometimes you just can't. So when you're a mighty contributor, 
it's a it's a when <laughs> it's a touch and go situation. I have contributors who write regularly. They kind of disappear for a while, and I'm like, oh, I hope they're okay. And then they come back, and it's like, oh, so great to hear from this person. You know, like it really is that kind of environment. And I also should have said this too. Like we we work with both um, like more professional and non-professional writers, right? So you don't you're not you're not pitching us. There's no deadlines. It's it really is supposed to be. Um, almost like a communal blog where everyone can put their stories in one place and then the extra benefit is that, you know, an editor does take a look at it and make sure that it's, you know, all polished. So, and I think a lot of those things we're talking about, I think they apply to general just like advocacy as well, right? So if you're someone who runs an Instagram, if you're someone who's trying to do other kinds of advocacy and you have to go black for a while or if you, you know, can't participate in in uh, your advocacy, I, I think there's a lot of guilt. There's a lot of guilt that like you have to always be giving back to your community. So the power of storytelling. Storytelling is powerful, but it, the power of storytelling is never more important than like your health and taking care of yourself. It really is an extra empowering thing that you can do when you can, because it's it's labor writing. It's labor telling your story. Um, and I'm glad that you asked that question because I don't. Yeah, I want people to know that if that if that clears things up. Great, Sarah, okay. thank you. And for the folks that we have online, participating online, yeah. we're gonna share your contact information with them as well so they can benefit from that. And Sarah's gonna stick around for a little bit during lunch if anyone wants to have a one-on-one -on -one conversation with her. <laughs> I'm sorry I'm early, but I guess before lunch, being early is better than going over. <laughs> Definitely. So let's give Sarah a round of applause. Thank you, Sarah. <laughs> thank you. Um, and I'm sad to say that that actually brings us to the close of today's program. Um, and on behalf of all of our speakers, our co-hosts, the American Bichette's Disease Association, the Vasculitis Foundation, um, and, and my colleagues um, uh, at Celgene, we're so pleased and grateful that you joined us, whether you're here in the room or online. Um, like to, uh, we're going to be following up as we said. Um, we've got some information from Sarah to share with you. I'm also going to put a plug in. We'd like your feedback, we'd like your input. Let us know how um, today's experience was for you, whether it was um, live here or virtual. Um, so we'll be sending out a link to uh, a very short survey, and we'd love to get your feedback. Um, for those of you that are uh, online, we're going to be signing off now. And then for those of you here in Atlanta, please join us for lunch next door. Um, and am I missing any final? I think that's good. So let's give you, all of you guys a round of applause for being here, taking time on Saturday morning. Thank you. Thank you.